Okay, I believe it's time and we have quite a lot of material, so I think we'll start and uh, hopefully more people will join on the fly. Well, anyway, uh, my name is Mikhail Matrosov. I'm an expert software engineer at Align Technology. Uh, and in Align Technology, uh, what we do in Align Technology, we move teeth. So that's basically my, uh, that, that's my usual day. That's what I do, except that part when the teeth, they don't fall off at the end of the day. But basically, yeah, that's, that's how it looks. Uh, and uh, how many of you uh, were on my, uh, on my talk, on the previous VP Russia, on the previous year? Oh, several people. Yeah, thank you for staying with us. Yeah, nice. Uh, so probably, probably you've seen something like this, th this picture. Uh, and, the, and, and the problem that we are going to explore during this talk is actually uh, exactly the same problem that were on the, on the previous year, but it turned out to be that uh, after several quite interesting questions that I had after, after the previous talks, I decided to explore this task more and to answer these questions. And uh, during the time, I developed the, the, the material for the whole new talk, which is quite impressive to me. And by the way, of course, when you have uh, the probability to re revisit the same problem and you look at the code that you wrote a year ago and you look at like, well, I can do better, right? That's, that's always the case. Yes, you learn. Yeah, I think I think I think it's quite normal. So the code was good. It was good. I just now I'm going to present even better. Uh, okay. So here is here is the task. Uh, since since we move teeth, let's have a jaw. Okay. And uh, in this particular problem, uh, we will consider the projection uh, of the jaw on the 2D plane, and then take the outline of this projection. And this is actually a, a closed polygon. With many with many points here, uh, and we have some uh, of it lying to the right of the y-axis, and uh, some point uh, some part lying to the left of y-axis. So we will call the part that uh, is on the right, like the positive part, and it is uh, it's in orange here, and the part to the left uh, is the negative part. Uh, it is uh, shown in gray here. So what we're going to do is, given the whole polygon, we need to extract its positive part. So this is our problem. That's what we're going to do. Uh, let's take a look at examples. So for example, we have something like this, very small polygon with four points. The positive part would be these two lines, or the, these two points. Okay, in this case, we have these three that are positive. We have like this, well, all that part that lies on the positive side. And if we have something that crosses the y-axis several times, like this or like this, then we report an error. So that's, that's all what we're going to do. It sounds like quite a simple problem, right? So the only complication that we uh, have to consider is that uh, the polygon itself is closed, right? But uh, probably it is uh, passed to us as a sequence of points, and we do not know where the sequence starts, because it might actually start uh, in the middle, somewhere in the middle of this positive segment. And we have to take this into account. Okay, so let's clarify our model. Here is our sequence. The actual coordinates of the points are not important for us, right? We only we are interested in whether a point is positive or it is negative. So here, positive points are marked with orange and negative are marked with gray. So uh, this is the presentation of the uh, sequence that we have. And if we have such sequence, we should treat it in exactly the same way as if as if we would have this sequence, like shift it a little bit, or like this sequence, or any of these sequence. So they are like shift invariant. The, whichever algorithm that we are going to come up with is going to be shift invariant. So we should uh, have this mental model of our sequence as if it was like circular. We don't have any like circular thing in, in, in the memory directly, so probably will receive less as a, as a some contiguous array or list or whatever. Uh, so here's, here's the problem, okay? I think it's quite clear. Who understood the problem? Okay, not bad, not bad. I, I, uh, I'll mark it as, as yes. Uh, so if you have something like this, uh, these numbers is just number of elements, unrelated to the coordinates, then we need to return something like this. So this is like our answer, all the positive points. If we have something like this, then we have to, uh, uh, to manage to wrap around, 
to take this uh, revenue round into account. And that's what we get, right? That's clear. And if we have something like this, so we like have several intersection of y axis in this case, then we need to report an error, right? Uh, okay. Probably you only st already started to like, think about your solutions, how, how you would implement this, right? Uh, so let me, let me uh, just offer you some solution. Uh, it seems like there are quite a lot of cases, actually, when we start to thinking about all the possibilities that we can have, right? So some several segments, all positive, all negative, this way, this way. Okay, uh, let's try to uh, invent a nice, nice approach uh, with which we can handle all of them like uh, uh, simultaneously. So let's call a segment a contiguous subsequence of elements with the same color. Quite self-explanatory, I believe. Yeah, and let's let's uh, just consider all the cases that we can possibly have. Case number one, there is only one segment that is positive, like this. Case number two, only one segment that is negative, like this. Case number three, two segments, first being positive. Then two segments, first being negative. Then three segments, first being positive. Three segments, four, like this. And we actually uh, don't have to even consider more. This is, this is already quite good. Because these are all the, uh, all the cases we need to consider to actually come up with the solution. And what we're going to do uh, is we're going to find, uh, well, here, here is actually the answer, right? So if we consider all these cases, uh, these, uh, this arrow with the, with the dot at the beginning is, uh, is the answer that we need to return. So if this is like segment, it's quite, quite obvious, right? Uh, if there are uh, many segments, then in this case, we need to report an error. And in this case, we need to wrap around the end, okay? Uh, so mm, now let's start inventing a solution. Once we have this breakdown uh, with all the cases, we actually can uh, analyze and try to find a universal solution for all these cases. We will start by finding the first positive segment, the first element in the first positive segment. So here it is. It is marked as a open square bracket on each of the segment, on, on each of the cases. You see it there, there. In this case, on second case, where we do not have any positive elements, we just uh, take it as the end, uh, the, the element past the end. That's the usual practice for uh, for standard algorithms and, and iterators. Uh, and you can see that uh, beginnings of all the first segments and all the cases are marked with this uh, open square bracket. Then we will find where this first positive segment ends, right? And we will mark the element after its end with a closing uh, uh, round bracket, like this. So now on all the cases, we have this first segment uh, marked with this half interval, right? And we know that half intervals is something quite used in C++. So probably we will need this. Okay, then let's find the second positive segment because we already we only interested in positive segments. Here is uh, the beginning of the second positive segment. This is the second uh, opening uh, square bracket. And if we don't have second positive segment. In this case, we place it to, uh, to the element past the end, as usual. And then we find the uh, end of the second positive segment, like this. Okay, uh, this might sound a little bit complicated, but this is actually everything that we need. Once we located all uh, these four elements, it's actually trivial to construct our answer. Because what we're going to do now is we're going to return second segment, and then append the first segment, like this. So, if our second segment is empty, like in most of the cases, then it doesn't count, we just return the first segment, which is the answer. But, if we need to account for wrapping around, then it works just fine. We return the second, and then we append the first segment. And that's it. So that's what we're going to do. And apart from that, we actually uh, can analyze the location of this uh, of these points to make a conclusion about whether the input sequence is correct or not. 
So this information is enough for us to implement a solution. Okay, now let's implement the solution. Let's start uh, with our uh, auxiliary data. So here's uh, our point that we're going to encode, and we all, uh, only need to know whether it is positive or not. So we have this predicate called is positive, accepting the point, and uh, return the result. Now with this, uh, let's start simple. So let's accept uh, our our collection of points just as a const reference to vector of points. That's like your default. So we have a collection, then you have a vector. That's your default. And you need to pass uh, this collection as an argument. And by default, you pass the constant reference. So that's what you do. Just uh, don't enable your brain <laughs> to, to write it. And then if you need to return something, uh, then you return by value, like this. So it's like default. That's, that's how we're going to start. Uh, and our algorithm needs to locate the first positive element. So the question, how are we going to find the first positive element? Find, almost, almost find. Find if, yes, exactly. Find if, yes, we have find if. That's exactly what we want. So find if from the beginning to the end, and we already have a predicate. And we have this begin, uh, beginning of the first segment, and you can see it appeared here. Okay, then how are we going to find where it ends, so the next point. Find if not. Yes, we, we have find if not. Uh, it it uh, might not seem like a very very interesting algorithm, but it's actually quite useful in this particular case, for example. So we have find if, and then we uh, need to find where it ends, whenever wherever it ends, so we use find if not. And pay attention that we are not starting at the very beginning. We started from, from the previous point that we found, right? So, uh, then we need to find the beginning of the second segment. Probably, probably you see that we're going to use find if again, right? And we'll start uh, from the end of the first segment. We'll like continue our traversal. And we see where it's going. So we're uh, finding the, the last point. So with these four lines, I think the, the beautiful four lines actually, I find them pretty beautiful. Uh, we found all the points that we needed to compose our solution, uh, and we've just traversed uh, our sequence once. So seems seems pretty cool. After that, we need to check the structure. So here we check. Uh, we actually can have two situations. One situation is there is only one segment, and if there is only one segment, then the second segment is empty. Here we check it. If the second empty, uh, second segment is empty. This means begin, uh, begin two equals end two. Uh, well, so either this is true or, or there are two segments, in which case beginning of the first segment need to correspond to begin with the sequence and the end of the second segment need to correspond to the end of the sequence. So it's really simple. Uh, we constructed this, uh, this expression, uh, this condition, uh, and if, if it is not satisfied, then we uh, throw around time error. It's pretty simple. We, uh, um, uh, that's how we're going to indicate our error. Okay, after that, after that, we need to compose our answer. We already know how to do that. And since this is quite simple implementation, we are returning the vector. Okay, so let's have a vector. And please, uh, when you have a vector and you're going to in, uh, insert something into it, uh, don't forget to reserve, because we, we, we already know how much elements do we have, right? was just sum of length of, uh, of these two segments. So please always remember to, uh, to reserve, because if you don't, <laughs> I'm sorry, it is in Russian, so uh, it's saying, if you, are, if you are not reserving, the organizers of the committee gave me permission to, uh, to punch you. I don't know how to translate that, Lisha. <laughs> Okay, so Ant Anton will find uh, Anton will, will, will find you and please avoid. Uh, now we reserved. Now we're inserting. So we are taking our second segment, inserting it into the sequence, and then we have uh, the first segment, inserting it into the sequence. That's how we obtain our answer. And after that, we just return it, and that's it. That's the implementation. This is the first thing I wanted to share. But uh, after that, I realized that it doesn't account for the whole talk, so probably I need to tell you something more. 
So uh, let's think about what can we improve in this implementation. And uh, what would you improve in this implementation, by the way? Any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, you could use distance. Yeah, it might work, uh, but this vector, so we show it's random access. But it, it's okay. What can we fundamentally improve in this implementation? Okay, great. So we do not have to return like our copy or something like this. Let's say let's not allocate any new memory for it. So because we already have the chunk of memory with our points and probably we can compose our answer uh, just inside this very buffer because sometimes the color doesn't need the buffer and we can reuse it. And we, and we even have a very nice syntax to express our intention. So here we're going to use exactly the same space, rearrange it and have a result. That's how we're going to do it. Now we will accept a vector as an error value reference. And it was a const reference before. And we have function, this is with exactly the same name. So now we have an overload of the function on accepting R value reference and const reference. And this is actually a very common technique. So for example, the assignment operator of the vector itself is implemented that way. It has two overloads on R value reference and const reference. So we don't need to go too far, too far. This is not an exotic example, I mean, this is okay. Then we have exactly the same code, nothing changes, the same vector. And after that, well, after that, let's apply some, some mysterious function called gather. We will, we will invent it just in a, few, in a few moments. And what it is going to do is given a sequence and these uh, four pivot points that we found, it is going to gather the answer in the beginning of the sequence. Like this, if we have uh, one, uh, one segment, and like this, if we, if we have two segments. So it is going to make sure that our answer actually appears at the beginning of the sequence it was given. That's what it's going to do. And if it does right what it does, then we can just throw away uh, all the other points at the tail. So we're resizing the vector and we decreasing the size of the vector, and after that we return. Okay. Probably you notice something strange about the last line. <laughs> yeah, you might think we don't need a steady move, but you see the rule. The rule is like this. So yes. You never apply, it's like you never ever apply a steady move after return, except when you do. It's a very simple rule. I get the idea? Well, this guy gets it. Well, so the, the problem is that we do not need to apply a steady move when we have return value optimization. But return value optimization doesn't work for a reference, so we accepted a reference to some object somewhere there's just no way compiler can apply return value optimization on that object. It doesn't know where it came from. So the only thing it can, it can do, it can move, move it. But in order to move from it, you need to apply steady move. Okay, so I actually, uh, I have this helpful uh, reference to Stack Overflow answer explaining this, uh, this particular thing in details. Uh, okay, back to our gather function. So that's what it's going to do. Uh, for this input, it's going to provide this output, and for this input, it's going to provide this output. Uh, is there a very simple way that we can implement this function? Rotate. Rotate. rotate, thank you. Yes, rotate. We can use rotate. Behold, rotate. Okay, you're not excited that much. Rotate. Th this, uh, this is what it's going to do. So we have our sequence. Uh, we have our points. Uh, let's consider the first option, uh, where the second uh, segment is empty. So begin two and then two, both points uh, to the last, both points to the last, right? Uh, and then uh, in this line, we decide that if the second segment is empty, then we're going to define begin one as middle. And what rotate does, it, well, actually, 
shifts, I don't know, rotates, shifts your sequence in such a way that the element that marked as middle is going to be the first. Just watch. Like this. So that's what rotate will do. And it will, it will do its best to do it efficiently. Well, in the second case, when we have two segments, we define middle to point to the beginning of the second segment. And after we rotate in it, it shifts to the beginning. Like this. And now we have our answer inside, uh, inside the sequence itself. So I'm not claiming this is, this is very efficient. We're going to work on it. But this is quite simple. So to, to, uh, to make like a proof of concept and see that it works, uh, we can implement it like this. So let's watch how it performed, actually. And let's have a little benchmark and a little data. So this is our data. Uh, we have 2 to the power of 20 elements, approximately 1 million, million uh, elements. Half of them uh, are negative, half of them are positive. And positive are concentrated on the first and the last quarters uh, of the sequence. So here's our data set. Here's how we're going to measure the performance. Um, and this is the performance graph. So here we have, you see several columns, and each column I correspond to the compiler. Blue is uh, Microsoft Visual Studio. Uh, brown, I believe. <laughs> brown is Clang, and green is GCC. So this is our first version. And by the way, yeah, uh, you see that each column has a dark part and a light part, right? So dark part is the time we've spent inside the function, inside the function that we wrote. And the light part is the time we spent iterating over the result of this function. These times, they are actually quite small and the same for this thing because we return in a vector and it's quite easy to iterate over the vector, but we will change this in future, believe me. So for now, they're quite small. And this is our original implementation that uh, allocates new memory and returns a new vector when we accept and by const ref. So you can see, for example, that Clang performed better, Second is GCC, and the last, but not the least, is MSVC. Yeah. And one disappeared in function rotate. And one. Well, we, d we don't actually need it, because from the layout, we know where it's going to, to point. Divided by negative elements. I'm, I'm not sure I understood what you're asking. This? This? Uh, so the question is where this element is going to go? Well, watch. It goes here. It's okay. Uh, okay, back to our benchmark. So this implementation with uh, copy and vector, with construct. And this is our implementation where we're going to reuse the same space. Well, looked quite surprising to me, actually. Because first time I checked, I checked on MSVC and the timings went down. I was like, yeah, of course, they're going to go down. But then it turned out that for Clank and GCC, they, for some reason, they went up. I'm not sure. And <laughs> by the way, Visual Studio is the best uh, now. Yeah, yeah, I see the look. <laughs> but still. Again, uh, all the benchmarks, they are re 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 reproducible, actually, so I will provide a link to GitHub so you can uh, rerun the, all the benchmarks for yourself and check maybe I just messed up uh, everything and this is plain wrong, but I hope it's not. Okay, mm, so it's strange that they got worse, but the approach itself, it looks pretty promising because, you see, we do not allocate more memory, which is quite nice. So when we can reuse it, and, and we actually reusing it, and which saves memory, so it's not only about time, it's also about the memory. Okay, so let's try to, uh, to improve our approach of reusing the data. Uh, let's have a little uh, graph, a little decision tree. Uh, 
What if we have just one segment, for example? Just one segment. And for example, it happens to be just in the beginning of the sequence. In this case, we don't need to do anything, right? We are, we are good, obviously good. And when it is not in the beginning, we do not actually need to rotate. It is enough for us to move it to the beginning. And the crucial difference with the rotate is that we don't care about these elements. We don't care about end two. Yeah, it just doesn't matter. We're going to erase this tail anyway. So that's why we can hope that this approach will, uh, will work faster, for at least for, for this one segment, right? Uh, then what, we, uh, what if we have two segments? Well, it might happen that way, that we actually have the room for inside, uh, inside our sequence for these two segments to be swapped like this. So we first move first segment forward and we move second segment backward like this. And again, we have the answer in the beginning. This is the correct answer. And we don't care about what's left. What's left behind, we just don't care. We're going to erase it. And if we don't have enough room, okay, we can always fall back to rotate, like this. Okay, sounds good. Now let's see how it performs. Oh yeah, well, now let's see how, it, how it's implemented. Uh, I'm not going to go into details of, uh, of the implementation. It's basically what we've just discussed. Uh, several uh, things I think might be useful for you uh, on this slide, for example, this is TD move. This STD move is not the usual STD move. It's not what you like used to think STD move does. It doesn't cast anything to our value reference. This move actually moves things, right? So this is like this is standard algorithm, and this is like STD copy. So given uh, given a sequence and um, iterator, it uh, it instead of copying of elements of this sequence to the new one, it actually moves all elements to the source sequence to. Uh, to the destination one, and since we're uh, yeah yeah in our uh, in our test data we have ints, so it's completely the same whether you move them or you copy them, it's the same. But now we uh, to emphasize the fact that we don't care about what's left behind, we use move here. Okay, uh, then someone was asking about STD distance. Here we have STD distance. Yes. Great, great. We will come to this in, in a few slides. Yeah, thanks for the list. Uh, so uh, you see about the distance. Uh, I, I didn't use, use the distance for iterators of vectors because they are random access. I know that I can apply minus on them, but for, uh, this function doesn't actually. It actually works works just fine on bidirectional iterator, for example. So we can we can use the distance here, and we have like support for the bidirectional iterators for list for free. Okay, and you see this pattern. We move backward and then we move. So what does this mean? Who understands why we use move backward? Okay, you see we are moving uh, two elements in different direction. First forward and one backward. And the one that moves forward, we need move backward for it. Well, it will become clear in a second. So here is the initial sequence, and we want to move it forward like this. But you see, they can actually uh, overlap, right? So if you start from the beginning like this, and you copy the first element first, then you're actually going to spoil the tail of your very sequence, right? So in order to avoid that, you need to start from the end. So you need to copy the last element first, and then copy the rest of the elements. In this case, you will be fine. That's why we're using move backward here. Okay, now let's see how it performs. Uh, any ideas? So, who, who thinks that it is actually going to be faster than, than the second version, than this one? Okay, who thinks it's going to be slower? Yeah, skeptic here. Yeah, nice. Uh, well, remember the set that we used? In this set, we have enough room to make this exchange, and exchanging segments actually less work than rotating them. So yes, we see the gain. And what, what do we have? So for MSVC and Clang, we actually improved the initial times, just a little bit for Clang, but still, and we, we are saving, saving up memory here, which is quite nice. Uh, and for GCC, I, I, I just don't know. 
I, I just don't know. So just uh, I didn't use uh, I, um, I didn't apply any efforts to optimize it. It's just uh, compiled with the default settings provided by uh, uh, CMake release build type. Uh, it, uh, it applies minus three, I believe here. Uh, but I didn't uh, didn't try to to tweak the code in in any sense to get the benchmark better. Okay, great. So we can see on this button. And we already have this idea that we, since we, uh, we can like reorder the connections between our elements without moving the elements itself, right? And we can, we can be guess that this might sound like work for std list because that's what std list is for. You can re reorder several. Uh, several points inside, preserving the elements themselves, the physical location, but you will change the uh, the sequence. So let's try and implement approach with the std list. Uh, and here we we immediately accept our value reference for std list because this just makes no sense to copy std list. What we go, what we want to do is to play on existing std list and reorder the elements a little bit and then return the result. So we do not even uh, create constraint overload here. This part is exactly the same because you know the standard algorithms, right? This, no, this works in everything, okay? So it's different iterators, but still it's, it works exactly the same. And after that, we have this little magic, erase, splice, erase. I will explain it in a minute. And we return the, the same points. Rearranged <coughs> with, the, uh, with the answer at the beginning. Okay, so now let's see how it works. Here is our lists, uh, two cases. So first we call it erase, and in this erase we erase in the elements that we don't need at the beginning of the list, like this. This is a very simple operation. We just uh, repoint the pointer. That's what we do. It's very simple. Uh, nothing happens in the second case because we don't have elem negative elements in the beginning. Then we splice. And splice means just take these elements and put them uh, like if they were starting in this position. So uh, take a look at the, uh, on, the second, on the second case. After splice, the pointers are reordered in such a way that our sequence has the proper order that we need. And after we reorder the pointers, we can erase what we have at the end and that we don't need. Again, erase. And voila, magically, we just have the pointers rearranged in such a way that our result is, is formed of exactly the same elements that we had in the beginning. It's a very cheap operation, very cheap. Hmm. <laughs> I was going to ask about, yeah, but it seems like you already got the idea, right? Uh, we do not allocate anything here. Dynamic memory deallocation is not that expensive operation. Take a look. Take a look here. You see what it is? This is what we're going to do outside of the function. So when we return the result and we iterate over the result, so this part is iteration over the list, and iterating over the list is a big deal. Yeah, because it's like randomly scattered on your heap, right? Uh, so uh, other compilers perform better. Oh, boom. yeah, perform better. But but still, you can see that yeah, probably a study list is not the, the right approach here. Yes, you are exactly right. I believe the problem is in cache locality. It's because you have to uh, hop from one one point of memory to another. So it's kind of expected. And this is, <laughs> there were many unexpected things uh, in the benchmark, but this one is expected. Okay, great. So, uh, nice try, but no, sorry. Sorry, still list. Okay, so now let's go further. Uh, we had, no, be, uh, prior to that, we actually re were returning a container uh, with our result, but we don't have to have a container, actually, can have a view of the initial container. 
right? So sometimes uh, we can we can make sure that the container leaves. We just return a uh, non-owned in view. It's like uh, you know array view or string view. So let's go back to the vector. It uh, didn't work with the list. Sorry. So let's go to the vector. Uh, let's place order here, just for now. Uh, yeah, this part is exactly the same. Nothing changed. We uh, find our points, and here is how are we going to compose the answer, the range. So this uses boost range library. And this code actually prints a simple. So we construct range over the second segment like this. Then we construct range over the first segment. And then we join them. It's that easy, right? So it sounds like a little magic, right? So what happens here is actually that boost range function is quite smart. It creates a very interesting iterator called joint iterator. And it's, uh, this iterator is aware about uh, where it is pointing to. And when you advance it, it first go over the first range. And then it understands, oh, I reached the end of the first range. Then I need to go to the second range. So that's what, it, uh, what it's going to do. Hmm. So take your guess. Is it going to be faster? Mm. Give me some hands. Okay, it's going to be slower. One skeptic over there. Well, actually, it is going to be faster. For some reason, it's not that faster for GCC. I just don't know. But I believe I installed the proper version. There was the latest version. I checked it. Uh, again, MSVC for some reason just performed quite well. Why are you so? Why, why, why do you think MSVC is so slow? Is probably in, in some cases, but here, actually in benchmarks, performed quite well in several cases. Um, okay, um, but let's, let's have a look at this part. This means that for Clang, for example, we, uh, we performed the body of the, functions of, the of the function quite fast, and then we spent most of the time, time iterating over this uh, of this complex range, which is quite expected because, yeah, this is a smart iterator. It needs to decide where, where it needs to go, right? So, the obvious next step, let's have our, have our own iterator, right? Okay, but you know, when it comes to the iterator, it's actually not that simple. It's lots of stuff to implement. It has to be consistent. And you need to make sure that all these fancy iterator traits works right. And there's, there's also this a conversion between const and non-constant version, version of iterators. And iterators may be const, or it may be const underscore iterator. We've heard about this. What the hell is this thing, right? So instead of doing this, uh, we can use boost iterator for set. Much simple, right? Well, actually, it is simple. It's just some boilerplate code to initialize uh, the, uh, the link between our iterator and iterator facade uh, from boost, from boost iterator. And then we can define all these like 20 operators or so in only six core functions. What's that funny? <laughs> oh yeah, I understand. I, well, if you want, if you want it, it to be easy, let me show you. Well, th this is easy, okay? But we want our own, right? So that's how we're going to do it. Uh, well, it's much easier than to implement all of them from scratch, really. And uh, all our logic is contained in this particular function called dereference. So when we try to dereference, we actually see uh, did we already wrap over the end or not? We are not inventing joining iterator, by the way. This is not join iterator. This is our particular iterator that can only wrap over the end of one sequence once. That's all it can do. And we hope that it will do it good, right? So in our code, this is the same. That's how, how we implement it. Uh, here, because our iterator is not that smart as join iterator, we need to have some decision. We need to uh, actually check are we going to wrap over the end of the sequence or not. And if we do, then we, uh, then we provide the proper starting point for it. 
And uh, one thing to mention here is that wrap and iterator is a template class, right? But here we create it without specifying template arguments for this class. So this is C17. And template arguments are deduced for us by the compiler, just like it used to be and it still is for template functions. Now it works for classes. And just uh, note that we didn't pay any, any extra uh, effort to enable this. It just works out of the box like this. Okay, so we create quite specialized thing and we really, really hope that it does what it does well. So what do you think? Is it good? A little bit better? Or maybe you think that boost, iterate, uh, boost joint iterator is already super optimized and we are not going to beat it? <sighs> One skeptical there. Well, yes and no for, well, mostly, mostly yes. So for MSVC, it, it's almost the same. Uh, it's, it was really uh, uh, just a, li a little bit slower, but I'm not sure, maybe it's just fluctuation. I'm, I'm not sure. For Clang, considerably uh, faster. Uh, and for GC, it's a little bit faster. Okay, uh, so I think we, we have a success here. So if we want to like optimize this approach, we need our, our own iterator for a specific case. Yes, we can do it. And yes, probably we could do it better than Boost, probably. Uh, okay, so prior to that, we were only working with the containers and uh, specifically vector, but it is just it's C++ and templates and Alex Stepanov, etc. So why not being generic, being universal? So it's actually very easy to transform our implementation to generic one. Uh, well, here's implementation for boost range because it's a uh, little sh uh, shorter and simpler than for our own iterator. But the transformation that we're going to apply here might as well be applied to a version with a wrapping iterator. So it's very easy. Some template over here, iterator range over here, then use it instead of begin end. Then this is actually, we, uh, yeah. Uh, in this code, we know the iterator type. So when you have template code where you just don't see uh, anything and only auto, 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 auto. I'm not a fan of almost always auto. Here we know the exact type and we can specify it. Okay, and we will pass our uh, custom predicate. We, why, don't, why should we only search for positives? We can use any predic predicate, right? Okay, so here's our generic version. Now let's apply this generic version over the very same vector. How do you think? Is it going to be exactly the same? Well, yes, it's going to be exactly the same. Why so few hands? It's just, just we made it generic, okay? So compilers are quite smart. They, uh, they were able to substitute and inline all the stuff. Yes, it's exactly the same. Now, uh, this is our generic implementation with boost. Oh. What happened? Oh, I see. It's just Eric transformed our implementation with boost range to, to implementation with C20 ranges, right? That's what he does on spare time. Well, at least I think so. So, what changed? Let's pay, pay attention. Instead of boost join, we now have ranges view concat, which does the same thing. And instead of iterator range, we have ranges iterator range. Okay. And again, we do not, a ranges iterate range is a, a template struct and we do not provide template arguments for it because they are deduced for us by the compiler. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not that bad, actually. It's not that bad. <laughs> well, uh, you see, the implementation of ranges, ranges v3, uh, that are maintained by Eric on GitHub, uh, it heavily utilizes expressions v9, C14, and Visual Studio does not support uh, expressions v9 to that level, so that's why they fork this implementation and they create their own branch that might be compiled with Visual Studio 2017. And it works. Great job. <laughs> right? Okay, so let's rescale a little bit like this. 
Uh, and we see that, uh, what you can see here? Okay, so for ranges, uh, and uh, uh, well, I believe that Clang performed quite well here. So it's all, almost the same. I'm not sure why this one is smaller than this, uh, this, this one. Probably this should be the same. I don't know. It's the, this is real data, you know. I always have this problem with real data. Uh, just doesn't want to be as you want wants it to be. Okay. Uh, and for GCC, it, hmm? yeah, yeah. Well, in theory, there is no difference between practice and theory, but in practice, there is. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is this is not in the standard yet. This is just uh, implementation to support TS. So I believe it pre performed actually very well, because for boot range it's probably like developed for decades and it optimized in many things. It's field tested. But it's just supporting TS. So I think it's it's very good actually for me. Now, so we uh, looked on C plus plus twenty ranges, and then. Uh, well, I promised you coroutines because yeah, no, no talk can be without coroutines. So here it is. Let's try to solve our task with coroutines. Uh, it was quite simple for Visual Studio, actually. Just uh, use slash await and you're here. And for Clang, it was like I, I went to Clang and I asked him, hey Clang, can I, can I please have a coroutine? And he's like, well, get yourself a generator because they, they, they don't provide uh, like default implementation for generator, they have support for coroutines. But we need generator to be able to yield. And that's what we are going to do. So we used generator from CPP Carol library, and I choose it because it has the most stars on GitHub. And I believe this is the only valid metric for software quality. Okay, so here it is. We, let's accept the same vector. Uh, but um, in this case, to simplify compiler's job, actually, just uh, n not forcing them to compile uh, generic coroutines, because it's at, at, at this level of development, this might be uh, challenging. Okay, and we return std generator. std generator is the type that is going to encapsulate the coroutine handle for us. This is exactly the same, and here is actual Coroutines. Well, I hope it looks much more easier than coroutines example on any other talk. That's how it should look. So what we do, we iterate over the second segment and we yield every element in it. And when once we are done, we iterate over the first segment and we yield every element in it. And on the color side, we can use this generator and Actually, just as range, we can uh, plug it into a range based for, for example. So we yield, uh, actually, for, for, for the first element, we yield it, suspend, use it, ask for second, resume, yield it, etc. That's how coroutines work. So this talk is not about coroutines, so I'm not going to dig into details on it. Hmm. Okay, so we've heard a lot of buzz about. Uh, the stuff that coroutines are very fast, okay? So who thinks it's actually going to be faster than boost range? Okay, who thinks it's going to be slower? Well, yeah. Well, you understand that coroutines are much, much, much more powerful than that. They need to create some handle, and this is not, uh, this is not even uh, optimized implementation. So I think they performed actually quite well the level of development. I don't know whether there is any fundamental barrier uh, why they, uh, w whether they must be slower than this approach with ranges or not, or maybe at some level of development that might be optimized in a way that they are just as good. I'm not sure. Mm, but anyway, I think the results are quite promising. So this is, uh, this is the current level of development. Hmm? Question? Uh, well, I return it by value, but uh, I'm quite sure that for this particular case it doesn't matter because this is a struct of two ints and most probably it is stored somewhere in a dedicated place in the curtain handle from which we are reading it. Uh, but we can try uh, to, to use a reference, but probably uh, we will see something different. So here, uh, the, uh, the dark parts uh, this is the body of the function. Uh, well, this is the body up to the first yield. Okay.
okay. After that, we suspend it. And after that, we uh, iterate over the result, yielding, yielding again. But it, it, it counts here as the uh, calling from outside the function. So this is the time for yielding. Well, I think, uh, I think it's, it's fair. Well, anyway, I reported the problem to, to Gore just to, to make sure it is, uh, that they made faster. Okay, and Gore was, of course, like it's going to be fixed soon, right? Uh, okay, now let's change our paradigm. Now let's say that we are not going to check our input, we're just going to trust it, okay? So we don't need this check. Uh, and since we know that our data is correct, then we know that the last point is always going to be just the last element of the sequence. This is the first operation we can make, the first transformation. And after that, we don't need the check. It's enough to have an assert. Or you can remove it at all, if you like. Okay. And who thinks it's going to be faster? Well, of course, it's going to be faster. We removed one, one algorithm. Okay. Uh, there, were, there were four. <laughs> we removed one. It's like 25% faster, right? Well, it uh, totally depends on the data, but you saw the data. It's like two, two segments at the beginning and at the end. Okay. But that's not really very interesting. What's interesting is what we can do with the... Okay, let's rearrange this a little bit. Uh, so we have this function find bounds, and what find bounds uh, does is just finds these four points for us. And then let's invent a brand new implementation for find bounds that we will take the, the fact that the structure is correct from the account. Uh, Okay, so let's consider this is our input sequence, okay? Uh, we, we do not see the whole sequence, right? We only see like a pair, a pair of iterators. So let's see on this, uh, let, let's take a look on this pair of iterators. And well, let them happen to be both negative. In this case, we might be sure that there is only one segment somewhere inside the sequence, right? Because we know that the structure is correct. Or it is going to be totally negative. Then let's uh, assume that somehow, just somehow, we know some positive element. Okay, how do we find any um, uh, other points in our sequence? We know that these points are going to be negative, and then these points are going to be positive. So there is something uh, in between them, some transition point. How are we going to find this transition point? Oh, binary search, there is no, or is it such algorithm binary search? Yeah, yes? Okay, uh, we, we can do actually even better. Partition point, yes, we can use partition point. Lower bound works for when you compare things. So it searches for numbers, for example. And partition point only checks predicates. So we can use partition point to find this point. And we have exactly the symmetric situation on the, on the right. So we have all positive, then, then all negative. Apply partition point, that's what we have. So see the blank sides. We did not even look at those elements. or well, probably on several of the, on them during partition point, right? Let's uh, consider a symmetric situation. So uh, we look on the first and last point, and they happen to be both positive. And then somehow uh, we know a negative point in the middle. I, I spent quite a lot of time animating this, actually. <laughs> Much more time than it deserves. <laughs> yeah. But still, uh, who recognized the pattern? Yeah, that was Glider from Conway's Game of Life. Yeah, the smallest spaceship, thank you. Uh, okay, so we have this element. And we have all positive, all negative, partition point, find, negative, positive, partition point, find. Works good, right? Let's implement it. Um, Let's not go into details, just take a look on uh, some interesting takeaways. Uh, first of all, we're using partition point here. Well, first of all, it's quite small, okay? It handles all the cases that we need, but it's quite small and it's good. Uh, 
And for when, when we were, were finding uh, positive and negative elements, we used find diff and find diff not. We have the similar thing with partition, but we do not have partition point not algorithm. That would be weird. Okay, so we need to negate our predicate, and we have this ability in C plus plus seventeen. We have this uh, utility function not fn, and w whichever you uh, you pass into it, uh, whichever functor it creates negation of this functor, exactly what we need here. Very convenient. And take a look at this if. So here we uh, uh, we find some uh, iterator and then immediately check it inside the same if. So this is C++ 17 style if, which is quite convenient in this case because we are not going to use this point outside the if, so we scope it inside this very if. And it actually saved us several lines on the slide, which is quite convenient. Okay, so now how are we going to find, assuming we do not have flying cat in our program, how do we find this uh, element in the center? Uh, well, it's actually quite simple. First approach, if we, well, if we recurse, it's quite simple, but we, we, can, we cannot recurse to, uh, to one branch and then, to, and then after we se fi uh, s uh, finished searching one half, switch to other half, we cannot do that, right? Because we, if the results are there, we already lost all the time. Uh, and if we, trying to divide these elements by half, then we came up with a regular pattern, but things are much better if we have an, uh, if uh, the length of our, of our sequence is a uh, power of two, so we divide by half, then for both of uh, those we divide by half, etc., cetera, et cetera, and we have this very nice binary tree with recognizable pattern, and the next step that we need to make to have our algorithm for finding, uh, for arbitrary number of elements, we just use the same approach with binary tree, but we like uh, cut it by the end of the sequence. It's very easy to compute such a pattern. So, so again, it's like on, on every level, it's just uh, uh, the constant offset that we have to make. So that's how we implement our function that is going to find any element uh, or satisfying the given predicate in the sequence. And here is the implementation. Well, nothing particularly interesting here, by the way. So, uh, what do you expect? Is it going to be faster? Yes. Is it going to be slower? Maybe. But you saw the data, right? So here it is. And the question is, where did the dark side go? Well, yes, it was just extremely fast. It was essentially zero. Now let's analyze how we did that. Yes, almost. Let's talk about computational complexity. So the total number of elements is n. The number of positive elements is k. Uh, the number of negative elements then is n minus k. And let's analyze the complexity of find any. So remember that we divide in half, then by half, then again, again. And we're trying to find a segment with the length of k with this approach in our sequence. What do you think is the complexity of this operation? Well, uh, well imagine you have, uh, you know the k. In this case, you just have to test every kth element, right? And in this case, obviously, you have a complexity n over k. But we do not know the k in this case. So we, uh, we're going to decrease this, uh, the space between the adjacent element uh, two times uh, at, at each step. So uh, we're going to, with this approach, we're going to look over the more elements, but not, not much than twice more. Okay, so the total complexity will be still n over k. So for find any, we have complexity n over k. Uh, this is for positive element, for negative it's obviously n over n minus k, and for partition point, you already know, it's logarithmic. So let's, uh, and the traverse time is o at k, we just need to go over the all k elements, right? So let's add it together, we see this nice formula. Well, not very nice actually, uh, let's try to understand how it behaves. So for example, for if k equals n, so we have only one element, then it's on. 
So we need to look on every element to find only this one. It's logical. And we have uh, k equals n. It's again n because we need to check a every element to make sure uh, there, is, uh, there is no uh, negative element in our sequence. But let's consider interesting uh, h point where k equals square root of n and do some math. And here's what we get. So now instead of O n, we have O square root of n. And square root of n is much, much, much better than n. So let's have a batch benchmark. Let's have a set of data. First line is we have all positive elements and half positive elements, and, and et cetera, et cetera, one element and no elements. And let's see how it performs. Well, this is implement, uh, implementation only for Clang because different compilers show exactly the same relative patterns here. So this is only for Clang. And this is uh, the simple generic version. It's very simple. Uh, it's before our changes. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's where we use boost range, okay? Uh, so inside the body, we always spend exactly the same amount of time inside the body because over, we iterate over all elements. But it depends on the amount of output that we have here. So we have all elements positive, then it takes some time to traverse. Half elements, less time to traverse, etc. So the interesting thing is what we have here. This is our approach with this smart subdivision. Okay, so you can see that yes, it performs slower if all elements are positive, and it performs slower if all elements are negative. But if we move just a little bit from these bounds, then we see much, uh, much improvement in performance. And if we draw our lines, uh, our graph, this complexity, this, this formula that we computed, here it is, and we can see that it maps quite nicely on the slide. Okay. Uh, great. So, um, I think I'm out of time and it's the dinner coming, so I'm going to finish uh, here. So, this takeaway is for you. Please analyze, uh, because we started with the analysis. Please recognize pattern and implement this with standard algorithm, because they, uh, well, you saw they, they were quite, quite good and we were able to perform uh, and implement all our, all our ideas with them. Uh, think about the interface because you remember uh, overload on const reference and ref ref how it allows us to handle cases. Uh, please don't afraid to be generic because it was very simple to turn our implementation into generic one. Actually, it might be might be helpful. Use modern C plus plus. Well, usually we abuse it, but don't abuse. Just use it. It again might be quite helpful. Uh, and care about asymptotic complexity because. Understanding of asymptotic complexity is what distinguishes a regular developer from a like, very good developer, actually. And if in doubt, always, always measure, always, because it is full of surprises, believe me, full of surprises. Uh, okay, and you can check for yourself, so all the sources available on GitHub and the instructions uh, and details how, how it was made, so you can run and uh, try to, to play with it. And in that, Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Before the questions, I would like to say thanks to my co-author, my wife, uh, who actually came up with the idea of these uh, several pivot elements that was not on my previous <laughs> talk, and the term for positive and negative, and the, the, she reminded me that there was a question about this stuff that we, uh, can actually skip the checks and improve our uh, computational complexity. And many thanks for helping me setting up Ubuntu because I'm a Windows guy. It <laughs> turned out to be, yeah, a real mess. So can you please stand up? <laughs> thanks. <laughs> okay, now to the questions. Uh, Mike. Uh, you can you can ask in Russian if it is more, more suitable. Okay, I have a question. Uh, have you tried uh, standard decas? STD dec. Yep. Yeah. Uh, good questions. Uh, good question, but you don't have. If I understand correctly, you don't have splice on deck. Because I'm you see. I'm not sure, but maybe you can try to create some structure like deca, and uh, I guess it might be f even faster. 
Uh, well, yeah, I, I believe yes. Well, in this case, uh, you need to transform uh, your input in some regular representation. Like in the program where it is used, it is actually a vector. You need to, to transform it. And you, you will spend some time doing it. Yes, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But good, good idea, yeah. Uh, have you thought about parallelizing your algorithm, at least in finding? Uh, uh, you see, it's worth parallelization when you have uh, less data and much work. So in this case, it's worth parallelizing. But here, we have very few work. It's just applying a predicate and quite a lot of data. So probably uh, in, the, in the latest approach, we can parallelize for partition point here and partition point here and do it in parallel, probably yes. Uh, but I didn't try. Yeah, but this is a good idea. This might work. This might enhance the times. Mm -hmm. You, mm, on which platform, uh, hardware platforms uh, these results? Uh, in comparison of uh, different different implementations, we we obtained. Here it is, single core i7, 790k, four years and, and caches and etc. А вопрос будет на русском, да? да а, мне кажется, можно было улучшить последний алгоритм, вернув в него проверку, то есть взять последнюю реализацию, добавить проверку полидности, которая требует прохода всего один раз по массиву, и мы бы получили реализацию более быструю, чем все предыдущие с проверкой, но при этом не теряя проверку валидности диапазона. То есть одним прогоном по циклам for можно проверить, что у нас есть ровно один или два диапазона, и если это два диапазона, то они прикреплены к краям. Совершенно верно. Но один, про, один проход — это уже линейная сложность. А у нас в итоге была сублинейная сложность. Три-четыре последовательных файнда делают ровно один проход. Раз find, два find, три find, четыре find. Это ровно один проход. В том-то и фишка. Потому что следующий find начинает там, где закончил предыдущий. Ровно один проход. Что, если нет больше вопросов? Спасибо а, большое. У меня вопрос oh, последний. Yeah. А, какие это использовал инструменты для профилирования своего кода? А, для профилирования это Google Benchmark. Спасибо. Окей, okay. thank you very much for coming.